So um, hopefully it'll help inspire or encourage our online um, attendees as well. It's one of the things they've been asking for, so we picked up a new, new uh, adapter box uh, a little bit ago, and this is one of the features that we can add to it. We haven't done it in Storm Lake yet, but um, if this works, we'll, we'll kind of keep adding and growing from there. So praise the Lord. I want you to grab your Bible go to Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. Amen. And what I'm hoping is it doesn't create an echo, so Nathan's going to check it off and on a little bit. It's not picking up my voice twice here, one from the soundboard and once from the room, but uh, hopefully it'll make the room feel a little bit fuller as well. Amen. Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 2 um, is where you're going. And as uh, soon as it is up, we're going to read it. It says this, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Amen. And then verse 3 is where I'm going to draw tonight's lesson from. But I want you to really focus on this. If we could just get down to the fact that God loves us and that we could trust him and that we do not have to be afraid, he would solve a lot of our faith cry crisis uh, in this journey. And verse 3 says this, Therefore my joy shall be drawn or shall draw waters out of the wells of salvation. Out of the wells of salvation. How do we draw out of the wells of salvation? With your grumpiness? With your negativity? No. With your joy. If you want access to the wells of salvation, you have to access it or draw water from it out of joy. It is a key. This is how you're going to beat back anxiety and depression. This is how you're going to fight back against the things that bring you down in this world. You can draw from the wells of salvation with joy. You can be seated here just in a second. My wife's going to put up uh, tonight's graphic a little bit. I have, been, I have uh, begun studying personally, and I don't know if I'll turn this into a series or not, but for me personally, I began thinking about wells. And there's a, there's a portion of scripture in the Bible where the children of Israel, as they surveyed the land, they looked at the Red Sea that was in front of them. And can we drink out of the Red Sea? No. no. The Red Sea happens to be one of the most salty bodies of water or ocean waters that is around. The, um, the uh, I, I don't know what you'd call them, the guys that study land and, and water and minerals and all that type of stuff, geologists, but it's, it's deeper than that. Um, they said there's something unique about it. It's one of the most warmest bodies of water on the face of the planet, the Red Sea is. They say it evaporates at such a quick pace that the salts deposit become heavier and heavier within the body of water. So it's a very salty place. And so um, the Bible said that as, as Israel was standing there looking and pondering all the battles they had been through. How many people know that if you're a child of God, you're going to have to fight some battles? And as they began looking at the, the water in front of them, um, they didn't know what to do. And then the Bible makes this unique note. It says that there were many brooks that ran beside them. Now, brooks are fresh water. But they could not drink. They did not drink from them. Instead, the Bible says they went, I love this. I should probably put that up because some of you think I'm going to be making this up. Um, it didn't preach very well last night in Numbers chapter 21. Dear, if you want to put that up. Um, Put, put just verse 4, 5, and 6 up. Just verse 4 and 5. Numbers 21, verse 4, 5, and 6. I, I love how, how, for me, the word of God, when, when God speaks, I can kind of chuckle once in a while. And so if, if you read um, Numbers chapter 21, verse 4, 5, and 6, and we'll get back to the verse. Numbers chapter 21, verse, uh, I'm sorry, 14, dear. I am sorry. I messed you up. I got so excited. Numbers 21, verse 14, 15, and 16. Numbers 21, verse 14, 15, and 16. Um, it says this, Wherefore, it is said in the brook of the wars, in the book of wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea and what he did in the brooks of Anron. And so it's refreshing this. And then in verse 15, And at the stream of the brooks that goeth down 
to dwelleth in air and lieth in the border of Moab. And so water was all around him. They decided to leave. So they were rehearsing all the recorded information that they had about all the battles. And they started pondering about the Red Sea. And they started looking at all the brooks and the streams that were bringing water. The Bible says they left. And where did they go in verse 16? To beer. Now that's actually a, a, a known location. But I thought it's ironic that many of us, when we become so dry and thirsty when we don't know how to satisfy the wounds of all the battles and we start looking at everything that's in front of us, not even realizing there's hope all around us, we'll often leave that hope and find ourselves in a place very similar to this place called beer or alcohol. <laughs> now, that's not what it meant in the Hebrew, but I just I find it very unique that, that in the English, I can look down upon this and I say, now, wait a minute. They ran from fresh book, brooks because all they could see was the sea in front of them and all they could talk about was all the battles that they've been running and dealing with that they turned and left from where water was being brought to them. They ran to this other place called beer. I just, I just happen to know a lot of people that do that. They turn from all the hopes that are around them and get into some addiction. And the Bible says that they got to a place. Now, beer actually means dry desert. But more specifically, it means a pit or a well. They found themselves in a pit in a desert because they ran to beer. And they got to the bottom of that pit, like often happens for most of us, and, and they had hit rock bottom, and they finally turned to Moses, and, and they gathered the people together, and they said, give us water. And Moses said, I'll give you water. And the Bible says at that very mention of water, they, they, the children of Israel began singing, and they sang this song, Spring up, old well. Spring up. And so we looked at this last night, and I, I don't want to rehearse all of this, but, but I, I began wondering about wells, the importance of wells. And, and I, in fact, last night I, I even confessed that most of us never start looking for the hope that is promised to us until we hit rock bottom, until we get to that place of beer where it's just dry and it's a desert and we're at the bottom, we're in the pit, we don't know what else to do, we're kind of ready to give up. And all of a sudden, here comes a word from just one man. It says, here, God can give you water. It's almost like a revelation. I don't know why I waited until I was 23 years old. And maybe I'm not like any of you in this room. But, but it's almost like this revelation. You mean this is what I've been looking for my whole life? You mean this is the answer? It was as close as the mention of his name? You mean all of that stuff that I have gone through, I didn't have to go through? I could find this place of refreshing? I don't know why it seemed so novel of an idea. I don't know why it was such a revelation. It was there all along. And yet, just like every other child of God, we seem to find ourselves in the same uh, place. So go ahead and, and, and bring back um, the portion of Scripture that I had tonight, Isaiah um, verse number 3 of, uh, of number 12. Isaiah verse 3 of 12. So I started thinking about all the wells in the Bible. And we're going to... Um, tonight's going to, again, as part of the introduction, we're going to probably dig into some things that are going to seem kind of dry and boring and that type of stuff. But I really want to lay the foundation. I really began asking the question, or I have been asking the question as I've been studying this, what is the importance of wells? Why does the Bible spend chapters upon chapters upon chapters talking about wells? Why do the children of Israel fight for wells? Why, why does the well seem to be the center point of most of the miraculous things that happen in God? So I've been kind of digging through this, and I'm going to take you on some of that journey a little bit. But absolutely, you can go a long time without eating. And in fact, they I, I do what is called internet inter, intermittent fasting, and and um, the medical world for the whole hasn't embraced this. And so they said, well, um, you'll um, you'll end up hurting your body if you fast too much. Well, they had a man that was obese. I mean, he weighed, I don't even remember, 600 and some odd pounds. And he did not eat. He drank because he had to drink, but he did not eat for almost a year when the doctor finally told him. And he lost most of that weight. He was down to like 180 some pounds. And for the most part, his organs hadn't failed. Other than the lack of activity, he was fairly healthy. He was now prepared to begin to exercise and that type of stuff. So you can go a long time. I know, I know medically they'll say that you know, eating is important, and I agree with that as well. But you can go a long time without eating, but you cannot live without water. 
You cannot live very long without water. Some of you right now, like me, because of all the caffeine we drink and all that type of stuff, we're doing damage because our body is craving something that is important to, 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 to live and to sustain life, water. And in my case, if I drink a Coke, the body has to fight to break the sugars down and get down there and grab the water out of it, and it's not very much, and all that does is make you more thirsty. And I understand all that. I'm preaching to the choir. But, but the whales that are mentioned in the Bible become so important to the community that the cities were literally built around. And if you go into ancient Bible cities, you'll find that the city um, sits almost, or, or I'm sorry, the well sits almost perfectly centered in the city. That's how important it was. We're going to read the, the story of uh, John chapter 4, the woman at the well too. And we can find that it was such a center point to it, it became the social blood of a community. They would come out early in the morning in the cool of the day before it got hot and they would draw water to feed their animals and that type of stuff. And then those that, that were practicing sin would have to wait until the rest of the people came so they could go out there in private. They won the war. Absolutely. If they could take the water source, if they could secure the well, they would take the well. Do you understand how important wells are into our life? We're going to look at a portion of scripture that talks about the Holy Ghost being a well to us. And yet we have people that won't fight for it. It's meaningless to them. They think they can live without it. No, no, no. Wells are very, very important to your wife. Uh, or your life. In fact, uh, in one portion of scripture, it's, it, it, I, I want to dig into this. I'm just starting to look today. It talks about the seven wells that Abraham built. And I thought, wow, there's got to be a, there's got to be a sermon in that. I don't know yet. Don't steal it, brother David. It's my sermon. If I get to it, it's my sermon, but <laughs> I know that's why I had to tell you, wait a minute. Don't, don't steal it. But wells are important. And so now I don't want to talk about when we talk about springing up a well, uh, I want to talk about, um, the well of salvation. These children got so dry that, that when they found themselves in that pit, they said, you know what? Um, we, we need water to start flowing again. We, we need something refreshing. And they began singing, oh, spring up, well, oh, spring up. And there's a well of salvation that's being offered tonight. And the Bible said in Isaiah that that well is drawn from by joy. Do you know why the devil wants to steal your joy so bad? So you can't get something to sustain life. You can't, you can't tap into something that's required for you to say. That's why he fights so hard to take your joy. That's why you're going to get to work and work's going to go wrong and, 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 you, and, and you're, going to, you're going to get set off and all the triggers are going to get pushed, that type of stuff. That's why it's such a battle to protect the wells that you have to draw from. And joy is one of the wonderful ways to draw from that well. I grew up around um, elders. I always wondered why they were singing and laughing and always happy. Now I'm beginning to understand. They knew how to draw from the well of salvation. Everything could be going around wrong and they'd be laughing and, and, and singing and clapping and talking about, oh, what a glorious day it is and what an incredible day it is and how much I just love Jesus. They learned how to tap into something that was going to protect them and keep them and and you can lose your mind in this world in a hurry if you don't understand the importance of the whale that you've been given. And we looked at last night, I looked at there's at least so far eight prophetic meanings of whales. You want to be talk, talk about being called. You, you got to be at a whale to be called. That portion of scripture that, that, um, that followed when they sang um, springing up a whale, uh, the one we looked at is kind of out of order here a little bit. I found it interesting because the Bible said all the nobles came out, all the princes came out. Um, all, the, all, the, all the men of importance came out, the, and they started practicing what the law said. And the Bible said they did something crazy. They started taking their staves and digging the well. Anybody know what a staff is? Just a stick. They didn't have much. They didn't have a lot of tools. They didn't have all this knowledge. They, they did do some metalworking. We can find that in Genesis, and so we know they have some intelligence, but they weren't using stones like we see in, in, in caveman days. They weren't doing that. But, but they, they got to a point where they were so desperate, they just grabbed what was in their hand and began digging. Um, folks, it's a lot easier than we're making it. We got a lot of people saying, well, I would be a lot happier and I would be able to drink from that well of salvation if, if I had all of this, this, and this. If I had more money, I'd be a lot happier. No, you wouldn't. If, if I just had some bills paid off, if I could just get out from under the weight of this, I'd be, no, you wouldn't. 
No, you wouldn't. But I promise you, if you take whatever's in your hand and just start digging, baby, digging, I promise you'll tap into something that'll be able to restore you. There's a well of salvation, and if you get thirsty enough, you'll take a stick and start digging in the ground just to bring water out of. Spring up, oh well, spring up. Well of salvation. I, I did some looking. I've been looking. This is just me. I'm just giving you some of my notes. Um, do you know that in, in, in one um, archaeological, uh, archaeological site, they found one of Abraham's wells? I found this fascinating. It was a principal well, meaning that it fed the city and everything that grew around it. It was 12 feet, 3 inches in diameter. Okay. So we're not talking about, you know, I, I already said you're going to dig a well with a stick, and you're thinking it's a little hole like this. You're just going to keep pounding. No, no, no. The, these, these men got together. They dug a well that was 12 feet and 3 inches in radius. Then I found it interesting that when they uncovered it, it was 45 feet deep. 45 feet. You think they were cavemen? No, sir. But well became so important to them that they used whatever they had and they dug a hole so big that the whole city could be provided from. I found it interesting because I started thinking, what if they drained the well? We, we know what wells are. You're basically just topping into an underground river or an aquifer, and it could go for miles. In fact, one of the largest aquifers in this area happens to be in Clay County, and it's connected. Um, everybody likes the water in Spencer, I think, still. You still like drinking the water in Spencer? It's okay. It's one of the, it's one of the freshest, um, most tasting um, um, water sources here in North America, and it connects from about um, Clay County all the way north, almost to the Minnesota border. It's an underground lake is what it is. So it's pretty powerful. And so when you dig, dig into that and you capture that hole, you're really only getting a straw's worth, even at 12 foot deep of, of a larger source. And you can actually drain it. You can pull water out of it so fast, you can drain it. And I, I began finding that it takes, a well to replenish itself on average takes five minutes a gallon to replenish it. But it can be replenished. Now, here's what I found interesting. When, when we talk about the wells that Abraham dug and all those type of things, as a general rule of thumb, archaeologists believe that wells on average, even today, are about 100 feet deep. So if, if it hadn't been for God who was helping Abraham, he still would have had to go another 60 feet to hit the average water source. As a general rule of thumb, one well that Abraham would put in in, in, in in biblical times, one well that the elders would put in, do you know how long it would last to feed that community or, or to provide water for the community? Watch this, about one generation. A community could drain a well anywhere from 30 to 50 years. One generation. We're going to be talking about the, the well of salvation. Do you know that if you're in that second generation, you're going to have to dig your own well? I mean, you might, you might have been brought to church by your mom and you might be able to feed off of some of their experiences or their dad. You might be able to be covered in prayer by, by one generation. You might enjoy the presence of God simply by being connected to one generation, but eventually that runs out and you got to dig your own well. That's where most people lose it. They say, well, no, 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 this is my mama's church. This is my grandma's church. This is my dad's church. This is my uncle's church. This, this church, no, 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 we don't hand down salvation. You got to at some point dig it out for yourself. It only lasts about one generation. I, I, found, that, I found that fascinating that even, even as smart as Abraham was, even as guided as he was, God knew that that water was only good for about one generation. Now you can maintain it and stretch it out. And we're going to look at, at one well tonight that was passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. They're going to say this is Jacob's well. But you know how hard they had to work to keep that well flowing? Do you know how many times they had to redig that well? And so there was nothing wrong with the source. It's just by nature, wells begin to fail in one generation. You got to dig out your own. I found it fascinating because in the search of looking for wells, um, the Chinese became experts at digging wells. They could actually dig wells that would produce oil very early in their, in their civilization, in their, in their life. They found one well that brought up oil in China that was 790 feet deep. 
Do you know how they dug it? Bamboo sticks. With bamboo sticks. Bamboo poles. They began turning them into drill bits and just kind of running it down there and coring out the door. 790 feet. You get desperate enough, you'll go deep. If you're looking for oil, if you're looking for water, if you're looking for anything worth anything, you will go deep. I got, I got, to, I got to confess right now, and I hope I don't lose my license over it. I have a guilty pleasure. It's probably a bad guilty pleasure. My wife hates it. My wife just absolutely hates it. I love history shows. I do. I could spend I could spend days and weeks just looking at history type stuff. YouTube became my best friend when they started robbing and stealing everything and putting up that type of stuff. But I got hooked into something called um, um, Oak Island, and they just ended their season. I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of the year. Well, they they've said it could be anything down there. That's somebody's treasure, and I have watched them dig. 200 feet deep into the ground and just knowing as that radio announcer says what is this another piece of wood could this be and then they'd say oh, the, the treasure of yeah it's, yeah it's called the it's called the money pit and I, I don't know how long it's been on i don't know how long it's like in season 20 or something like that i don't uh, i've watched it for almost probably a decade now am, am i it has a lot of history. I love it. And my wife will always come down because I have to find it the day after because I, we don't have television, so I have to find it the day after. And she'll come down on Wednesday and catch it, and she'll say, I, I'm, I hate to ruin the end, but they're not going to find any treasure. <laughs> and this morning when I got down to watch it, it wasn't on because it's over for the season. <laughs> but I found something else, Brother David. It's the lost treasure of the Aztecs. That's right. And, and they're digging right now. <laughs> they haven't found anything yet, so I'm not going to ruin, ruin anything, but they're digging. They're on like episode five or six right now, and they're digging. That's right. And so I'm there. I'm glued for like an hour. It's like maybe today's the day. But you get... You get wanting something so bad you'll dig you you get you get grabbing onto that hope that chance that something's better at the end of this hole you will dig and you'll grab bamboo poles if you have to you'll grab stabs if you have to you'll grab whatever's in your hand you get desperate enough my mom used to say this she said uh, I, I grew up in a family brother david they didn't make another meal you ate what was either on the table or you starved and she would tell me she'd say you'll get hungry enough one day to eat that as picky as I am, I knew that was it. And she wouldn't even let us make toast or jam afterwards or anything like that. You just eat what I, that was it. Man, I look at some of you moms, you're making three meals because one kid wants mac and cheese, the other one wants chicken tenders, and you got a roast in there and they don't want roast. You're crazy. They get hungry enough, they'll eat. You get broken enough, you'll dig. You, you, get, you get discouraged enough, you'll dig. There's a well of salvation that we're told to draw from. And I, I want to show you a couple of things. And, and again, this is just kind of from my notes. I, not really in an order of anything, but Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. I want to read just kind of a, a process here. Chapter 26 is actually called the history of wells. Very important. Lifeblood of a community. Genesis 26, verse 12 says this, Then Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now, here's one thing I like about Isaac. Whose blessings is he living after? His dad's. Isaac is blessed by proxy because Abraham had a relationship and Abraham was obedient to the Lord. I get a little mad at Isaac and, and, and I just have to resolve it. When I get to heaven, I'll have to apologize to him and figure it out. Isaac, Isaac wouldn't even go get his own bride. That just made me mad. I don't know why. It just rubs me the wrong way. Abraham didn't want to lose Isaac, so he hit him in the tent and told his servant to go get a bride for him. And his, The servant even got nervous and said, well, what if nobody wants to come? What if they think I'm catfishing them or something like that? But 
See, Isaac's just one of these people. I, I'm trying to find a, a battle that he fought. I'm trying to find something so I can say, you know what, I like Isaac. But, but beyond that, I did learn something about Isaac in this study. And so he's just blessed. He's blessed a hundredfold. He's just planting and reaping and favored and sowing and everything's going perfect. But watch what happens. Verse 13, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. And in verse 14, and he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great stores of servants, and the Philistines invade him. And verse 15, what's their only way to attack him? They envied him because of all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. They weren't mad at the flocks and the gold and the pretty wife that he got. They weren't, they're mad at that. They're just mad that he had all these wells. And so the Philistines decided they're going to attack. And they, they attacked very well. The Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. <laughs> it's kind of what Sister Jones said, that, that the great battles are won and lost over how well you protect the wells. Abraham was so blessed he didn't even set guard out over the wells. He felt he had so many wells he didn't even need to protect them. He just let the enemy come in. He was more worried about all that he possessed and all that he was blessed by and all that the favor that he had and how he could sow one seed and it would produce a hundredfold. Abraham walked around just in the blessings of God and never one time thought, I should probably protect the most important thing here, what my dad left me. He left me all these wells. So he never did. I guess, guess tonight more than anything, when we talk about the well of salvation, I, I almost want to get inside of some of your minds and say, do whatever it takes to protect it. It is one of the most valuable things. You, it's the only valuable thing you have. It, it's how you get to heaven. I, I can suffer a lot down here if I can still make it into heaven. A lot of stuff can happen to me down here if heaven is still my goal. Take heaven away from me, then nothing down here is worth and yet we got people walking around so easily willing to sell their birthright or so easily willing to give up their salvation or so easily willing to trade it in. Folks, there was a generation that was so afraid that the rapture was going to happen at any moment. They lived saved, sanctified, even when they went to bed. They made sure their hair was up, made sure they were still in a dress. They made sure everything was ready in case the rapture happened. We live so flippantly down here. Nothing matters anymore. I, I, tell, I tell some people once in a while, and I get so mad at Facebook on this. I tell some people, I say, hey, you probably shouldn't put that picture up there. And they tell me this. What I do in the privacy of my home is nobody's business. Okay. You post it on Facebook, it no longer becomes privacy. I didn't know that you had a drinking problem. I didn't need to know that because all I hear about how you're saved and sanctified and how blessed you are and how favored you are and God loves you and that type of stuff. And then you put something stupid up like that. Don't your salvation mean anything to you? There was a time we were embarrassed by the things that we were struggling with. There was a time that we kept stuff in the closet because we didn't want anybody to find out. There was a time that we were fighting so hard to stay saved that we made sure our dirty laundry at least got washed once in a while and, and, and we protected what we were fighting and we were trying to get, get to heaven one way or another even if we had to fight this battle in private. We, we've got a generation that does not care about the well of salvation. Could care less. And the enemy, I'm warning you tonight, the enemy knows that. He's not after your money. He ain't after the house you have. He doesn't want the car you have. He doesn't even care about the girlfriend or boyfriend or you have or the spouse you have. He doesn't care about any of that. But if he can plug up that well of salvation, he can end your life today and you ain't going to heaven. That's how important it is. I can live homeless as long as I get to heaven. I can walk if I have to walk as long as I get to heaven. Salvation is the only thing you got worth keeping. Amen. Everything else can be thrown away. And so the enemy got watching and said, this guy thinks he's so blessed. I'm going to take away his wells. And he filled them with the earth. Now here's the wonderful thing about wells. They can be redug, But you got to be willing to dig them. In verse 18, and the Bible says, and, and I'm sorry, verse 17, and Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of uh, Gerah and, and dwelt there. In verse 18, and Isaac dug again the wells of water. 
Can you imagine knowing that you only got about three days to live and you got to quickly get over there and open up them wells? I'm sure that Isaac didn't just bring himself and maybe a child. I, I think I, Isaac brought the whole army with him and all of his men and all of his women. I, I, I believe he was just passing out tools and say, we got to get these open and we got to get them open now or this whole community is, got, is dying. He did not wait for tomorrow. He put in action immediately because it was the lifeblood. Doesn't the Bible say that now is the day of salvation? Today is the day of salvation. No man has promise of tomorrow. I, I, I give Bible studies to people, and I talk to people. They'll, they'll, it's, it's funny sometimes. They'll, they'll tell me, I'll I just wait till I'm old. I just, I'll wait till I, religion is for old people. It ain't for young people. And, and, then, and then the young people caught on. They said, YOLO or whatever. You, know, you only live once. Might as well live it up now while I'm young because when I get old, I'm going to have to get all religious-y and stuff. Nobody's promised tomorrow. There's, there's, a young, there's a youth group right now in Des Moines, Iowa that just had to bury one of their young people. At the end of, towards the end of school, she was walking home and got hit by a car. In Des Moines, Iowa. Whole youth group grieving now. She didn't know that was the last day. She didn't know that was the last service. No man has promised tomorrow. No man. Mankind. You could be gone tomorrow. It, it's one of the most important wells that we have to protect. And if the enemy plugs it up, you got to fix it today. You can't sleep on it and meditate on it and think about it. It's got to happen today. We got to get that open and flowing again. I'll never forget. And 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 um, if if Shanice is watching, I apologize. I I love Shanice and her family very much. And uh, it was a Sunday morning service right here. Stood Shanice's mom, Bible college graduate, wandered away from God, tried to fight her way back, took years, decades for her to even start showing back up. And she was in this service on a Sunday morning in this church, stood right here and just worshiped God, tears running down her eye, just praying and worshiping. She was, she was um, 40 Oh, don't get me wrong, Shanice. Shanice is watching. I think it was like 46, 47, 48, something like that. Young. Shanice had just gone to college, first year of college, starting her second year. She had her twin girls with her, and, and I think Tessa was still, Tessa DeWall was still in high school. And their mama stood right here and worshiped and prayed her way back through to the Holy Ghost, sat right here. As I stood in front of her, began speaking in tongues, tears running down her eyes. I didn't think much of it because I had I'd talked to her for, I don't know how many years. Year after year, we talked. She called me on the phone. And, Pastor, I want to give this. I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to come back. Just come back. I don't know how to come back. Just come back. Just over and over and over. And, and, and I should have rejoiced with that, but I was so busy praying for everybody else that you all left, and I stood right there by the door, and stand at the top of the steps was, was Renee. She hadn't left yet. I remember she, she started walking down those steps. She looked at me as she got to about where that carpet, it was a different carpet, got to the edge of that carpet before she went out. And she turned to me and she said, Pastor, if you could give me one sermon to watch online, what would it be that would change my life forever? I don't want to lose what I just received. I said, well, I, I think you need to watch David Chatwell's message, The Tragedy of a Wounded Spirit. And, and I think I, I showed it her on her little phone there, and she, she saved it. She said, thank you, Pastor. And we talked and said some other things. And, and I thought, well, it was good to have Renee in church. Boy, it was so good to watch her talk in tongues again. It was so, so good to see her pray and worship. So good. I think we sang, Here I Am to Worship that, that, that morning, too. It was so good to see her little twin daughter, daughter singing, Here I Am to Worship. It was their favorite song. So good. Monday morning, I packed my bags, and I went, I went up to Boone to a district conference. Somewhere in the afternoon around lunchtime, Monday morning, just, just, just 24 hours later, Renee starts messaging me and she said, Pastor, that is so good, that, that sermon you sent me. I haven't watched it all. I'm, only, I'm, I'm taking notes. She said, I, I'm, I'm only like 20 minutes through this. I said, you go, Renee, you go. She said, well, thank you so much for praying. She said something to me that Sunday morning that blew my mind. She stopped at the door and turned back. She said, I want you to know that you're a good pastor. She said, you, you have been one of my closest friends since I left church. 
She said, I could always count on you. You're, you, you're a good pastor. I said, oh, thank you, Renee. That, that's kind of you. And she, she left. So she kept texting. She said, I just want to remind you again, you're a good pastor. You're a great pastor. I said, Renee, we love you. Just keep trying. Keep fighting. It's going to last. She said, okay, I will. 7 o'clock, she messaged me or 6.30, something like that. But, oh, pastor, I'm only about halfway through this. She said, this is so good. I sent it to my best friend. She said, I sent it to Sue Berg. She said, oh, it's such a great video, Pastor. She said, I sent it on, or, or I'm planning to send it on. I don't know exactly when she sent it on, but sometime that evening she sent it on. I said, oh, oh Renee, just keep going. You're doing good. And somewhere that night, 8, 9, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I don't know, somewhere during that night, she set her phone down on pause from the tragedy of a wounded spirit, had a massive heart attack and died. Right there. Prayed her way through the Holy Ghost just a little over 24 hours before right here. She got the well flowing again, Brother Wayne. She opened it up, and it flowed, and it flowed, and it flowed, and it flowed. For over 24 hours, it was just flowing. And God said, that's enough. Come home. And I get this call, this panic call saying, Pastor, Mom's gone. My sister's gone. We had a funeral. This, this, is, this is no kidding. I, I was shocked. Um, I was gone for the week. I said, well, I, I, sorry, just let me know if I need you. I'll text you. I was texting um, some of the people back and forth that time. So I finally got back. And they said, well, we're going to have the funeral over at the funeral home. I said, okay, that sounds good. They said, well, because it's going to be a large gathering. I said, that, that's, fine. that's fine. We can only seat about 100 here or whatever. Everybody thinks there's going to be 300 at their funeral. Do you know what the average has been for the last 20 years that I've done funerals? 20, 30 at most, those are big funerals. Most of the funerals I do are about 12, 10 people that show up. I walked into the back of that funeral home and greeted the children, hugged Shanice. They were sitting on the front row over here and, 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 and hugged the twins and high-fived Testa and prayed and, 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 and said, okay, let's do this service. And we did this service. I looked up. That whole funeral home was packed front to back, side. They were standing outside. I don't know how many people were there, 300 and some people just... She worked at K KFC, and she worked at some other places in town. She just had connections with all kinds of people. I walked away from that funeral changed because I realized how important just one prayer service is, how important just one altar call is, just how important how one, just one message is. I realized that I, I could leave for heaven at any moment, and this might be my last service. This might be the last time you pray. This might be the last time you get the water flowing again. This just might be the last time you text somebody and, and say, hey, pastor, this sermon's good. Thank you for it. I'm going to give it to my best friend. I found it interesting because a couple of weeks ago, Sue Berg, who watches off and on now, called me and said, I don't know who else to call I feel like I feel like Renee would want me to call you pastor so I'm calling you I need help in our marriage and we've been praying as a church and she asked me again today to pray and we're praying and believing but I found it interesting that one person that was willing to pray back through to the Holy Ghost that God took home just 20 some hours later had already impacted that many people folks it it's not a game there is one well you have to keep open at all times. It ain't the blessing well, and it ain't the prophetic well, and it isn't, it isn't the give me well. It isn't the wishing well. It's the well of salvation. And if the enemy knows he can block it up, he's got you. Just in a matter of days, you're gone. You're out of here. I have, I have been um, more fascinated, not even fascinated, in awe by how many people will leave, or we call it backslide, and within days be so polar opposite of what they used to be. Because they ran out of that life giving. Only three days they were dead spiritually. <laughs> Now, I know backsliding doesn't happen in one service. I know that. It starts as I always tease people. Like, you know, the people that sit in the front row that gradually work to the back row, I know that they're just one row out the door. I, I know that. I'm just ticking. They're all, they're all looking like, what are you talking about, Pastor? But you can start seeing the change a little bit. I understand that, but it's fascinating to me that the minute they throw up their hands and say, I've had it, and walk out the door, just within days, give up everything they said they'd never give up. Folks, this is the most important well that you've got to protect. And the enemy plugged it up. And then the Bible says um, that, that Isaac began to dig it in verse 19. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and they found there was a well of springing water. Thank God for well diggers. 
In verse 20, and the herdmen of, of Gar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And they called the name of that well Iskak, and because they strove with them. I, folks, you, you, you start digging wells, particularly wells of salvation, everybody's going to come out and tell you you're crazy. Everybody's going to say, you don't need that. That's so old-fashioned, you don't need any of that. <laughs> They're going to start trying to steal your wells. They don't want you to be saved. Why would, why would they allow... This, okay, this is just a joke, right? You, you watch someone that gets married, the first thing they want to do is they want all their friends to get married. They're calling you up, oh, it's great, you got to get married. <laughs> I'm, I'm Brother Dale, I'm 52 years old. We're almost 30 years married. We dated for two years. We're almost 32 years together. People come up to me and say, I want to get married. I'm like, ooh. I, I, you're going to need some counseling before that happens. I don't think you're ready for that yet. <laughs> I, th I think you're going to need some work. And it's, it's, it is a blessing. The Bible says, he that finds a wife findeth a good thing. I, I understand. I believe all of that. But it's a lot harder than I thought it was. <laughs> but it's worth it, absolutely. But it's fascinating. You get, you get saved and you start setting yourself apart for Jesus. You just watch all of those friends that you thought were friends come out of the woodwork and say, you don't, you don't need that. That's crazy. They want you to be just as miserable as they are. They're not happy. They're miserable and you used to be part of the miserable game. There's no reason for you to be happy. You used to be cool. No, I used to be a drunk. <laughs> There's a difference, you know. I think I'm cool now. <laughs> My kids don't, but I do. They began digging, uh, verse, verse 21, and they dig another well and strove for that also, and they called the name of that. Um, you can read it. I can't. Sit in a, verse 20, 22 and he removed from thence and dug another well. Do you see the activity? The well was so important that when people started stealing it, they just started digging deeper. Or they just started going to another place and digging. The well is the most important thing in the biblical time because it provides the thing that will keep them alive. And they strove, they, uh, and they strove not, and they called that uh, name of that well um, Rothaboth. And, and he said, for, and for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be Fruitful all over a well. Verse 23, and, and he went up from thence into to Beersheba, and, and verse 24, and the Lord appeared unto him that same night. Um, we don't have time, in the, I, I might talk about it or preach about this. I find some of the most powerful visit, visitations happen because of wells. You start digging a well of salvation, you watch God show up. You start digging a well, you start seeing. Brother Fleming and I tease all the time. It's so fascinating. People get in here, they get the Holy Ghost, and then God starts answering all their prayers. Yeah. Just instantly. Yeah. And so I start slipping my requests in too. Say, hey, could you ask him for me on this too? Yeah. I couldn't, when I first got saved, when, when I first came into church, when I first met God, and he just began, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. We were broke. We couldn't even afford, we, this may sound bad because you're going to say that's not broke. I know that. But we would get like a 12-pack of Coke and we'd have to ration it out throughout the week because we just couldn't afford anything more. And then we get fighting about it. Like, you steal the last Coke. I didn't steal the last Coke. You got the last Coke. No, I didn't. You only get six. You know the rules. You get one a day, and that's it. And We couldn't go out to eat or anything. All of a sudden, we came into church. We started paying our tithes, and God just started showing up. I got, I got a, I got, let's see, I went from $18,000 to $32,000. I, I got over a $12,000 raise. And all of a sudden, things just start. We got a car. We bought a house. God is, I was getting up every Thursday night and testifying, God is good. I just got this and I got this. Other people, I, had one, I had one person, Brother David, it wasn't Brother David, but I had one old fogey dogey come up to me and say, well, well take it while you can because it won't always last that way. They'd say, when your head comes out of the clouds, your feet have got to walk on the ground. <laughs> they're wrong. You, you, dig, you dig enough wells, finally God will start showing up and say, I want to talk to you. 
You and I need to have a conversation. So the Lord appeared unto him that same night. This is where I find all of a sudden Isaac is starting to turn the corner. He's not relying on daddy's blessings anymore. Daddy's wells got closed up. He started digging. He started fighting for wells. He started becoming who he was supposed to become all through wells. And then he did something that happens at all wells. And, 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 and he said, I'll bless thee and, and, and multiply thy seed for Abraham's sake. And verse 25, he built an altar there. And he called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there servant, or Isaac's servants day, dug a... See how they're into it now? Now the well's the most important thing. We got to dig this. They're digging wells everywhere. They, say, <laughs> they said, we're going to stop here for the night and put up a tent. I'm just going to go over here and build a little altar. They say, hey, while you're doing that, we're going to dig another well. We see how this works. <laughs> we want God talking to us too, Isaac. And so we're over here digging another well. The Bible says in verse 26, and Amalek and went from him to Gar and, to, and just starts listing all these places. In verse 27, and Isaac said unto them, wherefore come ye to me, seeing you hate me and, 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 and hath sent me away from you. In verse 28, they said, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And, and we said, let there be no or now an oath between us and even between us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee. They started seeing genuine blessings. They started showing up seeing that not just the fruit of Abraham's prayers, they started seeing Isaac started having a relationship with God because of these wells. And they said, we, we don't want no more problems anymore. In verse 29, that thou wilt not um, do us no hurt as we, we have not touched thee and that thou hast done thee no, uh, nothing but good and hast seen that the, uh, or has sent thee away in peace. Thou art now blessed of the Lord. And in verse 30, he made them a feast and they did eat and drink. And there rose up between times in the morning, swear one to another. And Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. In verse 32, and it came to pass that same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had dug and said unto him, we have found water. And they called it um, Shabbath, and uh, therefore the name of that city is Bathsheba unto this day. This whole chapter is trying to document Isaac's fight for wells. It, 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 I guess I wanted to read it more than anything to you this, this, this evening as a, as a backdrop for what we are going to talk about to let you know, do you see the struggle in it? Do you see the enemy trying to fight for it? Do you, do you see that he has to keep moving and digging and keep moving and digging and keep fighting and digging? All about this well. Do you know what the trick of the enemy is? He's got you so sidetracked worrying about all your other stuff that you're not even paying attention to your will. There are some of you even here, here tonight, you're just so worried about all the stuff you got to get done. I got to get laundry done. I got to get over here at this time. I got to get here that time. You're so worried about fighting and protecting all the stuff that the enemy's already got you convinced that he can take your well at any time he wants you to. David makes this statement. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out breaking bread. Begging bread. And you're so worried about protecting your bread and your stuff. Jesus, when he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, he concludes with this thought. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added. Do you know what the other things are? It was a list of food and housing and shelter and all this type of stuff, all your needs. Jesus said, if you seek me first, I'll take care of all that other stuff. But we got it backwards. We got an enemy that says, I'm going to stop that well. And I'm going to get them so worried about protecting all their stuff that they're, they're going to let go of the, 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 the well of salvation. John chapter 4, before we run out of time, tells the story of this, this woman at the well. And it's really the story of salvation. John chapter 4, verse number 3 said, He left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And he says this in verse 4, And he must needs go through Samaria. On purpose he went there. Do you know that wells are places where divine appointment do you know God, when he wants to meet you, is going to meet you at a well? He's not going to meet you at your island of blessing. He's not going to meet you in your favor. He's going to meet you when you're at the well. And so the Bible says he gets up that morning and he's ready, uh, ready to leave Judea, which is praise, Judah. He said, okay, we're going to get out of this praise because he said there's going to be a person I need to meet. And he purposely goes to Samaria just because of one woman. Divine appointment. Wells. 
provide opportunities for divine appointment. Verse 5, and he, come, and he cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called uh, Sychar, and near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. The Bible says in verse 6, now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Everybody say, it's hot. <laughs> it's hot. Verse 7, and there cometh a woman from Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Because in verse 8, his disciples have gone away to the city to buy meat. Now before I read the, the next verse, do you know why that woman was all out there by herself? She wasn't, a good person. she wasn't a good person, at least in her own eyes. She wasn't worth it. Jesus is going to ask her about her life and say, Go get your husband. It's going to open up a whole can of worms. But Jesus said, I have must needs, and I'm going to go out there during the hottest part of the day or one of the hottest part of the day to meet this one woman who has been hiding all morning until all the neighbors leave so that she can go out there by herself. And there he sat. Do you understand who God is? When he wants to make a divine appointment, he doesn't need your blessing on who qualifies and who doesn't qualify. He doesn't need your approval about who's good and who's not good. I get calls all the time, Pastor, I don't think those people should be. I don't think this is had. I don't think they should be this. I don't th think they'd be. Who are you? We, we have a lot of people in the kingdom that think they operate in the gift of motivation. <laughs> or lack of motivation. Or even further, they think they, they, can, they operate in the gift of motives. I know what their motive is, Pastor. They're just trying to get a free meal. They're just trying to get this. They're trying to get that. God's never revealed that to you. There's a gift of discernment, but it's a gift of discerning of spirits, not, not a gift of motives. You cannot figure out their motive, and you cannot, you cannot, you cannot use it against somebody. I, I have no idea on any given Sunday morning who God wants to bless and who God doesn't want to bless. But there is a, something special about somebody that's willing to get to a well when nobody else is there just to get water. They got to look down and say, I'm going to clear my calendar, I'm going to clear my schedule, and I'm going to go sit on that spot. Now, here's what we talk about the, 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 the probability of free will. What happens if that woman would have never went out that morning? What, happen, what happens if she would have got up that morning and said, you know what, I, I have enough water that I really don't need to go out there. I'm tired of going out there when it's hot and just decided not to go in. Brother David's the one that taught me this because he used to call me. The one service I missed when I was in Spencer, he called me and said, 50 got the Holy Ghost. You ain't going to believe it. Everybody's running the aisles and... I didn't ever want to miss service again. Now, it didn't happen, but he was, he was telling me the value of one service. You know, we, it's interesting that, that often when God does something, <laughs> we always say, well, Jesus, you're four days late. You know what he, told, what he told them people? He said, I'm thankful for your sake. I didn't show up. He was thankful. <laughs> he was happy that he didn't show up on what we think our schedule is. But, but I, wanted, I wanted tonight, when we talk about the wells of salvation, can I assure some of you that are just weary, don't be weary in well-doing. Because if, if, if we, if we, um, if we uh, um, don't faint, I'm trying to paraphrase it, if we don't faint, we'll reap in due season. When it's the right time, you'll reap. So some of you that, that get so close to just giving up or quitting, can I encourage you? That's, that's the sweet spot of the Lord. That, that, that just, I don't know when it is, next service, the service after that, maybe one month from now. If you can just keep fighting, I promise you one day you'll have your divine appointment. But get to that well no matter what it costs. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He says one thing. He says, when I return, will I find faith? You know what faith is? It's hope. He said, I just want to know people still have hope. And what we often criticize about God's timing, we, we misunderstand the greater purpose. They thought he was four days late. He said, no, I showed up right on time, and I'm pretty thankful that I did um, for your sake. And this woman at the whale, I'm sure she could have stayed home that day, and, I, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, when we talk about free will, Jesus would have just sat there all afternoon just waiting, and if that woman didn't show up, she would have missed it. But I, I, I never know what sermon God's going to bless me with, but I want to be at all of them just to make sure I'm there when it happens. I really do. I know his word won't return void. All sermons are good. All, all um, times we get under God's presence is good. I understand that. But I also know there's divine appointments. And if I fight to protect that well, I know one day I'm going to come out. 
It's going to be a hot part of the day, but Jesus is going to be sitting there. And he turns to this woman in verse 9, and he says to the woman of Samaria unto him, or the woman of Samaria uh, turns to him and says unto him, How is it thou being a Jew ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritanites. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is it that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would give thee living waters. Um, as a sidetrack here, for some of you that want, desperately want to hear God's voice, can I add this? It's all about the right question. You learn to start asking the right questions, God will start learning how to talk to you and give you the answers that you want. Most of you are frustrated because you're asking the wrong questions God's not answering. Jesus said, listen, woman, if you would have, instead of asking me and worried about how this was going to get done, and started asking me about how much you could take or, you know, if I could give it to you, he said, I would give it to you. But you're more worried about wanting to know how it's going to happen. That's not your job. I know your bank account only has $2 in it, and I know that you, you, just, you can't figure out how this is going to work, and you've calculated, and you've run the numbers, and you're all educated and that type of stuff. And God says you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. That day they called us to uh, adopt Sophia. I've said this many times. We didn't have anything in the checkbook. I, I don't know what the exact number was, but, it, you know, 13 cents, 33 cents. We had nothing. And they said this. They said, well, you need to bring $10,000 money order with you when you come down to adopt her. And um, you also need to have um, a week's worth of vacation because it will take you about a week uh, to process through this. I didn't have any vacation. And I had no money in the checkbook when they called that day. And they said, would you be interested, you know, could you meet these terms and be interested in adopting this child? And my wife and I said, yes, absolutely. I didn't have any of that. But we started asking the right questions. We weren't worried about the how. The how. We, we didn't know where the money was coming, but I, I, I've testified this. My wife actually just brought the letter. I, I didn't realize she actually kept it. The next day in the morning I got in the mail from my employer saying, we will give you $5,000 should you ever consider adoption. The next day. And then I'm bold enough, I looked at it and said, well, Lord, I'm not very good at math, but 10,000 minus 5,000 still leaves me 5,000 short. And then we got a newspaper article um, later on, I don't know if it was that day or the next day, that said the federal government will also give $5,000 to anybody that's considering adopting. And I started doing the math, 5,000 plus 5,000, that's $10,000. I got in less than 24 hours because God made a way where there's no way. You get more concerned about your well, God will start showing up and doing prophetic things. You get more concerned about protecting salvation. That's the only prayer I pray. I, don't, I very rarely pray anything. My wife gets so mad at it and say, well, pray about that sickness. Pray about that. And, and I usually, like, Lord, I just want to go to heaven. She said, don't pray like that. It's not time for you to go to heaven. Well, that's not what I mean. It's the only prayer I pray. God, I want to make it to heaven. That's all I want to do. I want to protect that well of salvation. I, I have got to make it to heaven. If I go through all of this and lose everything, I'm okay as long as I make heaven my home. I want to make heaven my home. I want to be saved. I want my name in that Lamb's Book of Life. Now, I'm not, I'm not worried about losing my salvation, but I have got one thing on my mind and one thing only, that's heaven. Everything else is gravy. Everything else is gravy. He says in verse 11, the woman saith unto her, Sir, sir thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? That well, that Jacob's well, could be almost 100 feet deep. Verse 12, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? In verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Watch this. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. There is a well of salvation. He said, you can keep trying things in the natural, and it may last for a season or for a moment. There's even joy and pleasure in sin for a season, the Bible says, but it only lasts a season. He said, but if you drink of the water that I have in you will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. 
And verse 15, the woman saith unto her, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. In verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come unto thee. That isn't, isn't it interesting? Why out of all the questions he asks, why has that got to be the one question? He ruined the moment. He ruined it. No. In order to, in order to be saved, you have to repent of your sins. Amen. If you want that well, you, you, you have got to realize that there is one thing that separates you and Jesus Christ, your sin. And so she said, I, I, want, I want that well. I want that well of salvation. He said, okay, it's pretty easy. But he said, let's deal with the core issue here. Let, let's not talk about why you're here at 6 o'clock uh, or, or the sixth hour of every day. He said, let's, let's talk about the core issue. Go get your husband. And she says, verse 17, she says, well, I'm busted. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast answered well. I have no husband. Verse 18, for thou hast had five husbands. And he who thou, or whom thou um, hast now is not your husband. The guy that you're living with is not your husband. In that that thou hast said truly. Jesus just needs you to be honest. True. You don't need to confess that to any, any man. You, there's no confessional booth here. You don't confess that. But if you can't be honest with yourself and if you can't be honest with God, you can't be saved. We, we have a generation that so easily tries to justify everything. Well, you don't understand. I just come from a family there. I just this and I that. No, 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 no. Stop justifying it. Deal with the issue. Be honest with God. I'm a mess, yep. I, I've got sin in my life, God. He doesn't need a whole explanation. I find it interesting when the prodigal son came home, the Bible says he prepared a speech, and it was elegant. It was big and like this, and he didn't even get it out. The father just threw his arms around him, started putting robes and rings on him. All he had to do was turn that direction. That's it. He was still smelling like the pig pen, but he was, just, he was heading the right direction, and Jesus just started loving him. That's how easy it is. God's going to deal with your core issues. He's going to say, hey, go get your husband. And this woman just simply turned and said, I don't have any husband. That's all she said. God said, you did it right. Yeah. You're right. Thank you, Jesus. It's not going to work if we sit here and try to justify everything that we do wrong. You, you, that, that's good. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a good lawyer practice that you have or whatever, but it doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Go get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're answered right. Verse 19, the woman saith unto her, sir, I love this. I perceive that thou art a prophet. How did you know this? Every person's a sinner. Everybody has that gulf between them and God. God can't get to you until that sin's dealt with. Everybody has a sinner. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place we ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh that when you neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. In verse 22, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But, verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, the conversations you will have over a well. Oh, the sweet joy that you'll find out of the well. I, I don't know if I'll turn this into a series or not, but I have become so fascinated by wells and the fight for wells and the redigging of wells and the claiming and naming of wells that, that, that when I found out there was a well of salvation, I thought, that's it. That's it. And that I could draw from it from joy, that's it. When David, if you, if you want to read a powerful psalm, I read this and I say this to you all the time. Psalms 51 is one of the most powerful prayers. You know what it is a, a prayer of or a song of? Repentance. David had got caught in adultery. You know the one thing that he asked for? For God to return unto him the joy of salvation. That's it. He knew which well had failed him. And he said, God, if I could just ask you one thing, would you restore unto me the joy of the salvation that you've given me? Can you just give me the joy back of that? He said, if you do that, then I'll teach sinners their ways. <laughs> oh, the wells that need to be dug. 
The well of salvation is not the only well. Uh, I'm looking at several different wells. There are prophetic wells. There are, there are wells that battle. There are wells of worship. There are, there are all kinds of wells that we can dig. But I wanted to start here tonight. I introduced some of this in Storm Lake if you want to catch some of the other message. But I, I, I wanted to start with this one because this one's the most par powerful one. If you don't protect this one, you've lost everything. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. And I wouldn't mind if some of you would join me in heaven, too. That would be kind of cool if some of you would do that as well. That would be really nice. When I, first, when I first got filled with the Holy Ghost, I turned to my wife. I said, when we get to heaven, can I hang out with you? Because I don't know very many people going. <laughs> you know what she tells me now? She said, she said, in heaven, we don't need to hang out anymore. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to teach eternal marriage. I can't find it in the Bible, but I'm trying to teach it. I'm trying to convince her that we'll be married in heaven, even though Jesus said there'll be no married, given in marriage or taken in marriage in heaven. But she doesn't want me to hang out with her in heaven. She's like, then everybody will know. I don't want to be caught with the goofy one. <laughs> Why don't you stand with me? Anybody want to go to heaven today? I mean, not at this moment, but you, you want to fight the whale. Everybody thought your pastor went psycho. Anybody want to fight for your will? It's worth it. I don't care how many boring services you have to sit through. I don't care how many, how many things that you have to survive to get through. I just, I, it's going to be worth it, folks. It's going to be worth it. I look around this room, Sister Shirley and Brother Wayne and, and, and some of you. Man, we have come a long ways not to get hell, heaven as our home. We have fought way too many battles not to make that our destination. Why would I turn back now? <laughs> Why would I give it up now? There's nothing to go back to. Thank God for the well of salvation. I want to pray with you real quick. Father, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you so much for truth. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, there is a way. There is a way to make heaven our home. If we repent of our sins and if we are baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of those sins, if, God, we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and, God, if we follow after peace with all men and live in holiness, you said heaven would be ours. God, I want to make heaven my home. Help me defend the well of salvation. Oh, spring up, well. Oh, spring up. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. If you do me a